Today is Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of Holy Week in which we remember Jesus' arrival to Jerusalem in the final days of his life, the triumphal entry as it is known. So far in our Easter series, we have looked at Jesus, Son of God, anointed one, miracle worker. Today we look at Jesus, victorious king. Here he comes. John, can I have the first picture? Just as Zechariah promised, rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Everything about this moment speaks of sovereignty and victory. Jesus, victorious king. Let's read from the Gospels. They'll come up on the screen, but this is John 12 if you want to open it up. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of her devotion. Verse 9. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Matthew 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, Say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what we have just read from Zechariah. Say to daughter Jerusalem, see your kingdom comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The exact order of the events and those that followed varies between the Gospels, but they include the turning of the tables in the temple courts, many parables and important teachings, the Last Supper, and all the events that we're going to be remembering at our service here at 10.30 on Friday morning. But there's one more passage that I want to read, and we're going to have to jump the timeline a little bit, but it's the Garden of Gethsemane, and this is Mark 14. They went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. Then he came back and again he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. 
Returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough, the hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of, his, of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. I want to talk to you this morning about the true meaning of victory. And I've got three reflections for those who need encouragement today, and then we'll pray. The first reflection is that true victory is not primarily focused on current circumstances. It can't be if we're understanding what we've just read here. The triumphal entry? Really? John, can I have the second little picky? Is that supposed to convince us that Jesus is the victorious king? Look at him. Look at his current circumstances. Sitting on an unstable, tottering, young donkey on a stony path down a steep hillside. It's precarious. It's fragile. It's underwhelming. And yet this moment could not speak more loudly of victory. Lazarus has just been raised to life. Mary has just poured perfume onto his feet. And now the Son of God, anointed one, miracle worker, victorious king, arrives on the Mount of Olives and enters Jerusalem through the eastern gate. And the crowds erupt with hope as they cry out, Hosanna, God save us. This is all about victory. It just doesn't look like it is. This man on a donkey, the manner of his coming, does not look like the stuff of victory at all. But Jesus' definition of victory is very different from our own. And today, Palm Sunday, is a good day to be reminded of that. We always define victory as confronting and changing the outside circumstances that we are facing. But Jesus defines victory in a way that seems to involve enduring circumstances and fixing his eyes on something bigger. His definition of victory goes far beyond the alleviation of present suffering. Now, don't get me wrong, as I know you never do, but I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't contend for breakthrough now. I'll say more about that later, but in this first reflection, I'm just encouraging us to allow the Holy Spirit to recalibrate our understanding of victory. Particularly if we are tired and low on faith this morning, because I believe the Lord wants to expand your expectations today. Wow. And it actually begins with giving less weight to your current circumstances, even though they are, that's the very thing you need him to intervene on. So the first reflection is simply that true victory is not primarily concerned with current circumstances. It's concerned with something way bigger. Second reflection. True victory resides in the realm of the eternal. We always define victory as something immediate that brings an end to present trial. But Jesus' definition of victory adheres to an eternal timeline. He's about to enter the hardest week of his life. And yet it looks as if he's returning from a recent triumph, like a Roman general entering Rome after victory in battle. Jesus is already walking here as one victorious. This isn't the valley before the mountaintop. It's not the defeat before the victory. There's a timeline being enacted here that is not temporal, it is eternal. This is, for those who have eyes to see, unmistakably a celebration of a victory already won. You know, the, um, the journey that Jesus took on Palm Sunday is actually very short. John, last little picture, if that's okay. 
This is a picture that I took of my Bible on my desk at home uh, with a little bit of photoshopping on it. Um, Kate, Kate Middleton did it, so there might be some anomalies. But um, don't worry about not being able to read the text, okay? Just note, there's Bethany at the bottom where Jesus ate with Lazarus and Mary anointed his feet. Then there's Bethphage where the disciples found the donkey. Um, and, and then there's the Mount of Olives on the right and then the, the temple, with the eastern gate, just there at the top. From one little village to the next, and then down a hillside to a gate, it's about 3.2 kilometers or two miles in total. It would have taken about 40 minutes. It's a very quick journey in the physical, but a deeply significant journey in the eternal. What's my point? My point is that when we are facing trial, we often look to the physical, he looks to the eternal. If you just think about that picture of Jesus on the donkey that, that was just there. The physical is not particularly impressive to look upon. It's a stony path and a couple of villages. It's not that inspiring. But the eternal is stunning. If we focus only on our immediate circumstances, there's often very little to inspire. But if we focus on the eternal, there is a realm of faith to be accessed that will blow our minds. See, the short journey begins at a very intentional location. It started in Bethany, which is the site of two uh, really important indicators of what's going on on this journey that Jesus is taking. And they are a meal with Lazarus and Mary's perfume. For Jesus, this is a victory meal before there is any sign of victory. There's an eternal timeline going on. It's an eternal timeline moment. When I was uh, 23, I worked at a tree nursery to raise some money for my honeymoon. And there I met a man called Peter Jug, who um, was an uneducated former criminal, previously very violent, now redeemed, uh, gentle, overflowing with worship as he drove his tractor. And at the time, the most mature person I'd ever met in terms of intimacy with God and spiritual wisdom. And over four months, he taught me a lot, including how to access the gift of speaking in tongues, and he also taught me how to pray. And he taught me to always thank the Lord as if the thing I was asking him had already happened. That's all he said. Just thank the Lord, Paul, as if it's already happened. And that was a massive shift for me. And over the years, that one phrase has helped pull me out of fearful, fretful, faithless petitioning of God to prayer that is rooted in an eternal timeline. And I found that my faith has risen because I now locate my prayers in a victory already won. This eternal timeline, it, it pulls into the present a future victory that was won 2,000 years ago in the past. Does that make sense? You're nodding your heads, but it shouldn't. It doesn't make sense. Because we naturally locate our understanding of victory only in the context of present suffering and a desire for an immediate fix. Jesus locates victory in the eternal, and the eternal converges on him. See who he chooses to hang out with at the beginning of his last journey. Even as he's about to enter the worst circumstances of his life, he comes to Bethany. And Martha lays a table for him in the presence of his enemies. And Lazarus, the one who is raised to life, he, he reclines in rest and feasts with him at that table. And then Mary comes and pours out the highest moment of worship and affection and devotion in the whole of Scripture until we get to Revelation. Let me encourage you, even as you walk the narrow, precarious, stony path of your own challenging circumstances, Jesus wants you to recline at the table with him. He wants you to take your place of rest and eat with him, even in the presence of your enemies. 
even in the context of your circumstances. And he wants you to pour out devotion on his feet because that's where you belong in good times and in bad, at the place of worship and affection and devotion. If this was how Jesus chose to walk into his greatest suffering, I think it might just be significant for us because the next day he woke up and he walked as one victorious. Rest in him. Sit at the table in the presence of your circumstances, worship at his feet. That's how he walked as victorious king. First reflection, true victory is not focused on current circumstances, it's focused on something bigger. Second reflection, true victory resides in the realm of the eternal. Third reflection is that true victory comes from submitting to the Father's will. And that's a really hard message to hear if you are struggling today, particularly if you have been for a long time. But I want to encourage you that there is a depth of healing to come from walking your journey in obedience to God that walking in frustration to God will never bring you to. That you trust and love him even in trial is of more importance to him than your trial coming to a quick end. Because he wants all of you to be redeemed. Not just that you're redeemed from your circumstances. He loves you that much, that eternally. In our third reading today, we um, read about the harrowing events of the Garden of Gethsemane. Note what happens. Jesus asks that the hour might pass. He asks that the cup would be taken from him, that he would be saved from his immediate circumstances. Look how human he is. Look how much he understands what you're going through. But also look at what he does in this moment. He prays, then he returns to his disciples who are sleeping. He prays again, then he returns to his disciples who are sleeping. Then he prays a third time, and then he returns to his disciples who are sleeping. What's happening? Each time, it says, he declares that everything is possible for God. He prays that God would intervene to save him, then he submits to the Father's will. He prays that everything is possible for God. He prays that God would intervene to save him, then he submits to the Father's will. He prays that everything is possible for God. He asks that God would intervene to save him, then he submits to the Father's will. It's a declaration of his personal faith in the character and goodness of God, a request for help, and then submission to God's will. This is the pattern of walking with the victorious king. Father, I know that you are perfectly capable and perfectly good, I look to you and only you for help. I locate myself completely in your will. I mean, look how Jesus lives his life. Look how he walks in victory through greatest trial. And then note what he says between these three moments of prayer. He says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The enemy wants you to fall into temptation. He wants you to despair. He wants you to look at your circumstances because he knows that that is where faith fails. So Jesus says three things. Watch, pray, the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. What does he mean? First watch, don't fall asleep in your faith. Instead, be vigilant. Watch for the enemy's schemes because he prowls when you are in trial. Secondly, pray. Constantly, consistently fix your eyes on him, discern his will, and yield to it. It's exhausting kicking back. And then thirdly, be aware of the spirit and the flesh 
because it's perfectly possible to have a willing spirit but be completely overtaken by the flesh. Jesus is saying that the flesh is the realm of temptation. The spirit is the realm of faith. Wow. We fall into temptation through the weakness of the flesh. The way to stay connected to the willingness of your spirit is to watch and pray. To be vigilant of the enemy and fully orientated to the Lord. This is how you discover and stay in the Father's will. This is how you walk with the victorious king. See, Jesus submits to the Father's will. His victory flows from yielding. We define victory as confronting and changing the outside circumstances that we're facing. But Jesus defines victory as when you experience loss, but continue to pray and have faith in his character and goodness. That's how he walked in victory. Even in Gethsemane, even as his betrayer arrived, even as his friends deserted him, even as he was falsely accused, mocked, spat on, beaten and blasphemed, even as he walked through the streets bearing a crown of thorns and carrying a cross, even as he endured the piercing of nails and the stabbing of spears, even as the sky turned dark and his father stayed silent. He submitted to his father's will and trusted in his goodness, in his character, in his love. And he won for us an eternal victory. So should we pray for breakthrough? Because I've just said, don't look at your circumstances, don't focus on an immediate fix, submit to the will of God and keep praying. Does that therefore mean that we shouldn't pray for breakthrough? Of course not. We are absolutely meant to pray for breakthrough. The Lord is mighty to save. He wants his people to know his goodness in the land of the living. He's not a God who's lacking in compassion. He's good. He doesn't want us to suffer. He works all things to the good of those who love him. He never leaves us nor forsakes us, nor does he test us beyond what we can bear. He wants heaven on earth. The changing of outside circumstances is a defining feature of the advance of the kingdom. Wow. That's why we pray for healing and deliverance and a sound mind. That's why we spend time on our prayer ministry course looking at what faith is and how to walk in it. We want the kingdom to come. It's what we expect. It's what we cultivate faith for. We believe that's the heart of the Father. We believe breakthrough is his will. But what I've been trying to say to you today is that we need to be clear about the Lord's definition of victory. We look for a quick fix for our immediate circumstances and we call it victory when we get it. But I don't think that's how we're meant to pray for breakthrough. I think we're meant to make sure that when we pray, we are aligned to Jesus' definition of victory rather than our own, because his definition goes way beyond the immediate changing of our circumstances. Because for Jesus, victory is not about circumstances. It's about the cross. It's always about the cross. And I believe he wants to encourage you today to focus on the cross rather than on your circumstances. His victory is a victory that is bigger than individual circumstances, a victory of all victories. It's the victory over the power of loss and lack. It's a victory over every lie and all despair. It's a victory that destroys darkness not just the circumstances that darkness creates. His victory restores something bigger and deeper and fuller than the fixing of your circumstances. It's the victory that conquered not just illness, but death itself. It's the victory of resurrection power. It's the victory of the wellspring of life. And as I was writing this, I just said, Father, Jesus, Lord, what would you want to say to these guys today? And I I wrote this down. Don't be distracted by your circumstances. When you make your circumstances the focus of your attention, you'll be discouraged by what you perceive I am not doing when the source of your breakthrough is to be found in what I have already done. So look 
to my cross, not to your circumstances. The measure is not what you need, but what I have done. And have I not done all that is necessary? Have I not silenced the grave? Have I not brought you healing? Have I not proved myself? Look to my cross where all of eternity converges on me. It's the beginning of Easter week, and on Thursday we're going to meet in here to have communion together. Then we'll have a service on Good Friday, and then we'll gather for celebration on Easter Day. But right now, today, we're about to enter this week where we think about the degree of Jesus' loss, the weight of his suffering, the magnitude of his sacrifice, the depth of his love. And in his moment of deepest loss, Jesus continues to pray and have faith in his Father's character and goodness. And in doing so, he made room for the Father to be glorified through him. Hey, See, we're focused on outward circumstances in the short term. Jesus is focused on building a people who can contain his Father's will and live according to his Father's purposes. And that's what he wants to do in us. Because that's what he modeled in his own life, to live a life with eternity fully engaged and realized in the human heart, completely convinced of the goodness of God and able to contain his will in the face of circumstances so that his purposes can be realized through us to his glory that his son would be revealed. And just as he honored his son, the father honors you when you continue to seek him even through your darkest trial. Amen.